Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be back here and to be reading poetry and to be seeing old friends and new friends. And I'm going to read from recent books of poetry tonight. I guess some of them go back a number of years. This is from uh, my book, Rebel Lions. It's called Black Ivory. And it was, it was written at the Lowy Museum of Anthropology, where uh, Amy and I had gone, and we were looking at a show of walrus ivory carvings from about the 5th or 6th century, which had been buried in permafrost. And these delicate little carvings had been changed to bl shining black instead of shining white. And our reflections were in the uh, cases that they were in. And it was a, a, a very almost mystical experience for me. I felt like I was one of the carvers of those pieces. I am here, and I stretch through the silver constellations and hand you the carving that I made in my other body. It's a sinuous bear's head of ivory turned black by aeons of permafrost. And I stare into the glass. Your reflection is next to mine. We are made of the same stuff. For what is spirit but another chunk of black ivory? Lately, I've been writing blues, well, for the last number of years, since Ray Manzarek and I started working together, um, I've been paying attention to, more attention than ever, to the great poets of the earlier part of this century who sang with music. This is Lead Belly Blues. <clears throat> Lead Belly Blues get in my bones. I'm sick of old folks' tears and babies' groans. I'm chock full of this lion-eating room. I'm going where the eagle is going. Zero, America, I'm going home. I'll be where I hold my lover at night. My head's a hammer and my toes are stones. She's got a bed the color of a rose. Rain on the roof in the morning light. Lead belly blues get in my bones. Rain on the roof in the morning light. And I want to read this one because of what's happening this year. Uh, I think, and I'm not just talking about multinationals and uh, corporations, or even just governments, but uh, what's happened at the turn of this year has brought some heavy feelings to us. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people feel like desperados, even more than did before, or are willing to say it for the first time. If not, wait a couple of years. <laughs> Spirits desperado, I, I cheer and bravo the sight of negation and of hunger for soul. As a boy, I saw the mole and the eagle soaring and burrowing together, and imagined that love was created of hair and of feather that rubbed on the edge of the vast ledge of sight, sound, taste, touch, and of the smell of satin and silk, and of the guts of the butchered creature that writhes and grows a brain. I was sure it was not hell I was living, but I was reflecting the stain of that huge being called the stars. I knew it was not even heaven, but it is all divine. To be alive is to feast on desperation. I was reading that in Berkeley, and there was a street person there, an old man, well, old man, probably my age, and uh, I finished that. I said, to be alive is to feast on desperation. He said, yeah, but it's not supposed to be that way. <laughs> One of the best literary comments I'd heard in a long time. Uh, this poem begins, I often like to begin poems with lines from other works or from other people's poems or sometimes from my own poems. 
And this is called a spontaneous poem, beginning with lines from the Tao Te Ching for Amy. And the lines are, the beginning of the universe is the mother of all things. The beginning of the universe is the mother of all things. We were always together, and my heart sings. And I was a big horse with a spotted coat when you called me. And we rode in a boat and on a plane, and we were silk and dirt sprouting with heather. Then we melted, and I saw through your toes. It is always the same story. Here I am in opulent grimness and grizzled glory, free as a leaf in the wind. How I love to sit by you in the movies and see the profile of your nose. <laughs> Life's small pleasures. I was, I was coming down here on the airplane and a, and a vice president of one of the local universities was sitting next to me and he, and he opened this book of mine and he looked at it and he just looked at a page or two and he said, oh, I know about that. That's the way I felt when I got out of the hospital or it was clear what he was talking about. This is just right out of the middle of it. It's a long poem, 10 or 12 pages long, but it was a state that I had when I got out of the, when I got out of the hospital after a psychophysical meltdown and I was afraid I was going to lose it. It came back to me. And I wanted to be able to recover that and lay it down. And the state's thinking was like this. Nothing I know but courage. A leaf crashes on the roof. White feathers float. Machines roar, grinding trees into mulch. Dread not but the state. No flag for dread, slippery as grinding planes. It's okay, not. Red-breasted nuthatch, gracile, pinstripes, lovely as a baby girl's eye. Take me away where there is a frame. Float shapelessly, shameless, awash in crushed delusions, reforming a frame. Let it wait. Words come later now. This is from a book called Rain Mirror, which is half a long poem composed of haikus called Haiku Edge, and half of it is a poem called uh, Crisis Blossom, the first section of which is titled Graftings. And it, it was in this poem that I discovered even more than I'd known before how intense the act of the physical act of writing a poem, the spiritual act of writing a poem could be that, I mean, that we actually live on the edge of life and death in our art and or on the edge of matter and non-matter. And this poem went on many, went many places with me on many trips as I was writing it. Grafting One. Now I understand the sexual addiction of my young manhood was a crucifixion, glittering and lovely as an ostrich boa and smashed mirrors seen on acid. Now I see that perception is a shape of the darkness seeing itself, naked bodies in layers on shelves in space, and behind stalactites alight with themselves, seduce me with fleshy softness of their meat, calves, forearms, and the perfumes. The perfumes are lost as moths in our hormonal storms, but they direct us. They guided me. Grafting three starts with a quote by Goethe, the author of Faust and many great works of poetry and theater. Grafting three, here's the quote. Incommensurable and incomprehensible 
are the best of poetic creation. Now, I've got to admit to you, that sent me to the dictionary. First, I looked up incommensurable and then incomprehensible, which I had a better idea of. I realized that was a statement I wanted to investigate. Grafting three. Incommensurable and incomprehensible are the best of poetic creation, the old man sings. The galaxies are a river seen from this direction. The child knows it is all black behind the eyes and that flesh is a swirl of hungry fantasies just like shadows in kitten's fur. The black and yellow bee hums and dry mud crunches in the divine cruelty of nature. The soft new soul with its capsule of masks, tender and quivering, ascends into matter. Pink rocks slide over the cliff with a clatter. Smell of greasy food in the airport. That was written in Bryce Canyon and part of it, of course, in the Reno airport. <laughs> uh, as I, I, I was writing this poem, while I was giving solo readings around and giving performances with Ray Manzarek, and including the Taos Poetry Circus, where we read uh, on the same program with Quincy, and uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, where we gave the first poetry performance that had been done there. And I was getting very strained and sleepless and crisis-ridden, and came home and found out that the tickets to Bali had come through <laughs> and were paid for. <laughs> so the, the later part of grafting continues in Bali. And like here's grafting 25. The, the, there's not so much sign of the meltdown that's happening in this one, but. Eagles seen on acid are the rules that are broken in old poetry. The fierce eye a neighing hand of the boy. Brindle fur moves under the eye while the river mumbles in the dim canyon between huge rocks. Ferns and warts sprout from pale branches and cliffs of loose earth. Poetry wrecks tradition as it moves in the stream, bristling wings and feathers. This is the rumbling in the stomach, endless ache of the tension in the back. The toads and frogs sing like Haydn falling in love with Art Blakey. But Shelley and Sappho happen again and again. Uh, so after that, uh, after finishing graftings, uh, and a near-death experience in planes and sleeplessness and intense things like that. The, I went into a hospital and when I got out, the very first day out we began sitting. And all of my life, uh, I've, I've sat off and on with my friends, sitting, zazen, meditation, zen meditation. On all of my life, uh, I've been sitting off and on with my friends, just sort of uh, never well, you can't be a Zen Buddhist if you don't practice, so I never said I was one. I was sort of a fellow traveler. Uh, and uh, the day back from the hospital, uh, we, my wife said, well, it's time to begin sitting. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. And then she started sitting. and I said, no, you don't do it that way. <laughs> now you cross your legs that way. I know how to do it. So we started, and we've been practicing since. And out of that practice, came this book, Touching the Edge, which is literally, since although I was pretty old to be starting, uh, it's like a childlike starting with this meditational practice. I hate to call it meditation because meditation means something in the West that does not mean in uh, the East. It's a completely different thing, as far as I know, and I don't know anything about it. I've only been doing it four years. This is one of these poems written during discovering practice. It's number 34 of 99 Dharma devotions. 
And it's in honor of Kanan, the Bodhisattva of compassion. To give is the white hand with the long fingers and an eye in the palm putting forth what is one, already arisen and long gone. The squawking of jays is a gift in the trees. Be in comfort, Chet Baker. Be in comfort, Jean-Michel Basquiat. There are waves and facets and overlappings and slidings of chunks and non-chunks slipping into the ordinary, empty roar of the lion, plain as consciousness, not there. Touching the Edge, Dharma Devotions, number 67, also for Kanan. The white hand with long fingers, the white hand with long fingers holds an injured ego, touching its thorns, caressing the lids of its bloodshot eyes. Realms open and close in a tide pool. Clear, cold water streams from a vial, and every night is a new night. The thrum and glitter of the hummingbird comes from nowhere, and the doe steps awkwardly to look at the calico cat. Sunrise is nothing but pink, orange, abalone pattern scatterings of clouds. And I'm going to read from the manuscript I'm working on now. And I believe the last one I read, I'm going to read three. I'm going to read, if time allows, and I think it will. Uh, I'm going to read three poems that are called Plum Stones. The book is called Plum Stones, Cartoons of No Heaven. And it's an investigation. Uh, investigation isn't the right word. It's a discovery. Uh, pitting myself against, uh, joining with, discovering, if possible, the line between matter and non-matter, between being and non-being, between sunyata, uh, nothingness, which has its own physics, and the physics of being, which has, I suppose, the same physics or another physics. And the epigraphic quote in this is from the great visionary of the 13th century, Ehe Dogen. 1243 CE. Being is past and future elements. Being is past and future moments. Things which are not sequential are being. Things which are not aligned are being. So these are, I, I haven't read these to an audience before. And I, I think they're kind of challenging. I mean, they're challenging to me. Uh, and, you know, if you, sometimes you're listening to something and your mind goes away, you know, just sort of floats away. Well, it may happen. And when it comes back, you shouldn't worry because I'll still be here reading them. <laughs> what I mean is just go, go with it. Just let it drift. Fog. Hey, fog around rainbows. Rainbow in clear light. Horse heads like eagles. Eagles like horse heads zooming through storms. Big drops splashing on the redwood deck rail. Inner and outer realms mated in sizelessness. Rainbows pouring in waterfalls. Waterfalls gurgling in childhood. Compassion swirling through mercy. Birth goes out with a light bulb. Always here in continuous practice. A brown moth resting on old lace and a can of peaches in tomorrow's firelight. Plum. Plum. Somewhere a plum is ripe. 
swirling like horse heads in rainbows. Purple plum, green plum, blue-black edging through white with hands in prayer, ordinary as palm pressed to palm in a mudra. Bowing in blessing after all these years. A plum is ripe. Cold, hard, gold-brown pears in the rain by the eaves, alert with bare branches. Like kitten fur and deer eyes, plain as a skid mark. Ordinary, ordinary as bowing in blessing, zooming through storms. Eagles like horse heads, horse heads like eagles, fog, fog around rainbows, like kitten fur and deer eyes, plain as skid marks, ordinary, ordinary as bowing in blessing, ordinary as palm, pressed to palm in a mudra. A mudra is a hand gesture used in meditation or teaching. Plumstone 6. Vain, vanity, vanitas. As a black river is vain with white rocks, vanity makes thunder in soft flesh, imagining nothingness. The gleaming face held high descends to the crowd. Dragon Slayer arrives. Blue silver waves crash loud. Water lashes and swirls. The same story rolls over and over, giving meat to another body. Compassion, wise one, for these scattering skulls and crude, jagged stones. Bring quiet to Lorca and the unending memories of tiny black beetles and pink seaweed of crusty coral at the shallow edge of the pool. All one, a black river is vain with white rocks. Vanity, vanitas, wisdom, compassion, in the smile of the dragon, in the slayer and slain. Mouse tracks on the snow, pictured in childhood books and screams in the air. Palm, joined to palm, head bent in a bow. I love you, one layer of belief hiding another. I swirl at the center with folded legs while a rooster crows. Vanity, vanitas, a black river is vain with white rocks, all one. And this is Plumstone's 14 written in La Jolla last time I was here, written in La Jolla, San Diego. As we came in from the airport, I saw the SeaWorld Drive sign, and I remembered where one of these lines comes from. Plumstone 14. Be draggled, glamorous, old as coyote breath, new as come to garçon, here, gone. Here, past Sea World Drive. Even Dada failed. Smog, bush poppies, mountain air. Rustle of the Black River, moving white stones without fail. Legs crossed, hands in a mudra. Sweetness and cheery blandness of domestication is not the way to the eye of the Dharma. Also, outrage loses. I'm dressed in a robe of anger, sitting in an inside no different from outside. 
Now the sky has FedEx planes and two stars and planets as unreal as molecules, string theory, swathed dimensions. The robe flashes, wizard moons, volcanoes, and moth jeweled patches. It's better to practice seeing the mountain and the roadside culvert are present and gone. Not blown out like a candle. Not collapsed by indifference, but they stand on the same feet. Gasho to all sutras. Gasho to daydream cartoons. Gasho to daydream cartoons of monkey mind. Gasho to the old scholar surrounded by cool snakes. See the landscape of industrial buildings is there. Not there. There. There and not there. Nearby are the footprints of mastodons and camel herds in Pleistocene earth, real, solid, and empty. So that was San Diego's gift to me. I want to read one last poem, a haiku, brand new haiku. The cat chasing hummingbirds, a deer speeds by in the misty rain. Thank you very much. Thank you.